tonight, our Bible study, chapters 24 and 25 of Job, we're continuing in this theme of in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. That comes from Proverbs 10, 19. It's guiding our study of this section of the book of Job. But our title for this week is, is where is God when the wicked are prospering? Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever asked that question where you, you look around you and you think, is God going to ever do anything about this? You ever been in that place? We're going to talk about that in depth tonight. So our goal tonight is to tackle chapters 24 and 25 of Job. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a two-part review as we get started. And, and the first part is just an overall review in case you're not familiar with the book of Job. You, you need to know how we got where we are tonight. You'll remember that it was in the opening chapters of the book of Job. We learned that Job was a blameless and upright man and you cannot miss that in the rest of the study. As you get beyond chapter one, you need to know every single time you read in the book of Job that God himself called Job upright and blameless. Therefore, for the rest of the book, Job has to be looked at as an upright and blameless man, regardless of what he thinks about himself, regardless of what others say about him. And so Job was upright, he was blameless, but listen, he was not perfect. He was not sinless. And so what it means that he was upright and he was blameless is that he was in a right relationship with God. That means that when he did something wrong, he made it right. He went before the Lord with true brokenness of heart. He had repentance in his heart, repentance in his mind, but repentance in his actions. So he was upright in his relationship with God. We also learned that Satan had his eye on Job and he made accusations against Job's character. And God gave him permission to test Job. And so in a matter of just a few days, Job lost everything that he had worked for for years, all of his riches. Just kind of think about this. You've got this thriving, prospering business. And then in one day, it's gone. Your retirement is gone. Your Mercedes are gone. Just everything that you've ever accumulated, it's gone. But that wasn't the worst of it because then Job lost his 10 children. And then he lost his health. He's sitting on an ash heap at the city dump, just you know, mourning and trying to figure out what's going on. And his three friends come, and instead of comforting him and showing compassion, they uh, started making these horrible accusations against Job, saying that he was suffering because of his sin, that God was paying him back because of his unrighteousness. And what we've been watching is Job riding this emotional roller coaster and he goes from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, doesn't he? Have you ever been there where you're going through trials and you wake up one day and you're like, it's okay, man, God's on the throne and, and we're gonna lick this thing. And by the time you get the first cup of coffee down, you are at such a low place. It's like, I think I'm just gonna go to the edge of the city and jump off, you know? And if you live in a place like Greer, that's not gonna work. In Albuquerque, you can go to the mountains and jump, okay? You know, you could, but, but, you know, I don't know if you've ever been there, but Job is up and down. And last week when we left Job at the close of chapter 23, Job was in a really good place. And that brings us to the second part of our review. We leave our general review and then we get back to last week. So let's do this. Let, let's review a big chunk of chapter 23 so that we can set the stage for tonight. Begin in 23.7 with me, please. Just back one page from where we started. And we're going to go all the way from, from verse 7 to, to verse 17. Notice here, Job says in verse 7, Look, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. And so in the midst of these deep trials and the sufferings, Job knew that God was near him. But the problem was that at the same time, he felt like he couldn't get in tune with God. I know God is here, but I, I can't figure out what he's doing or where he is. I, I think he's on the right. I look, he's not there. I, I look on the left. God is not there. I sense him behind me and in front of me. But by the time I, I turn and look, I just, God is not here. I don't know what's going on. And, and so what's encouraging is to see that in this state, Job fell back on what he already knew about God. And this is, this is really important when you're going through trials. When something doesn't make sense in your walk with the Lord, you always go back to what you 
do know. And look what he says here, verse 10. Job talks to us about what he knows about God. He says, God knows the way that I take. You know, notice that? Job says, I don't know a whole lot about what's going on, but I know a couple of things, is that God's got his eye on me. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And so Job tells us here, he says, I don't really know what God's doing, but God knows what he's doing. And that's a great comfort when we're going through something. We don't know what's going on, but God knows what he's doing. And notice Job says that because God knows what he's doing, I can trust that this trial I'm in is going to mature me. And in the midst of this trial, Job said, I refuse to abandon him. And we talked last week in depth about how often believers, when stuff starts going bad, they abandon God and they abandon the church and, and you know, they have to wait till everything's okay and then they come back. And, and, you know, Job didn't do that. Job said, look at verse 12, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. Verse 11, my foot has held fast to his steps. I've kept his way, I've not turned aside. The second half of verse 12, I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. In the midst of this trial, Job said, there were times where I would rather sit with my Bible open and I don't know if he had a printed Bible. My personal opinion is, no, he did not. But he had the word of God as it had been revealed to him and Job would say, to us. There were times where I would just say I'd rather not eat, I'd rather not drink, I would rather just sit and take in the Word of God because it's the only thing that'll fulfill me in these deep times of trial. And then verse 13, Job says this, and remember he's on this high spot, I know that God knows what he's doing, I know that I'll come out on the other side of this trial like pure gold. But then look at what he says. He says, but he is unique and who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does, for he forms what is appointed for me and many such things are with him. Therefore, I am terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I'm afraid of him for God made my heart weak and the Almighty terrifies me. Because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness and he did not hide deep darkness, from my face. And, and this is Job kind of bringing it to a close. And this is what he says. He says, I know that God knows what he's doing, but that doesn't make it any easier to be in the position I'm in. And Job says, I got to be honest. If God takes me through another series of trials like the one I just went through, I don't know if I'm going to make it. And so when he says, I'm scared of the Almighty, I fear his presence, I'm terrified at his presence, he's basically saying, I know that if God takes me through another round of these trials, I'm not sure I can really hold up. I think I'm on the verge of, you know, failing as it is. And so Job goes from the highest of highs, but then he comes back to reality. He doesn't pretend that everything's okay. He's a realist. He says, if this continues, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep going. And so that brings us to chapter 24. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at a glimpse into the heart of a frustrated saint. We've been looking at the words that everybody in the book of Job is speaking, and we're trying to figure out what's going on in their heart. And tonight what we're going to see is, from Job's words, we have the heart of a very frustrated saint. And Job sets the tone for chapter 24 and verse 1. Read with me if you would. Job says this in his opening words here. He says, Since times are not hidden from the Almighty, why do those who know, um, I'm sorry, who know him, see not his days? This is a very hard sentence. This is a very hard phrase to figure out. And I spent a lot of time this morning really, really digging and trying to figure out, Job, what are you saying? You know, I'm stuck on verse 1. I've got two chapters to study tonight. I'm stuck on verse 1. And I went and I did something that I don't often do. I, I went and I dug into some of the modern translations of the Bible. I, I'm not against modern translations. I think that the NIV is a fine translation. I think the ESV is a fine translation, although I don't agree with a lot of the scholars who were part of putting the ESV together. And the NLT is great for reading. 
Um, but I want to tell you that these three Bibles blessed my socks off this morning and brought me out of an hour or so of spinning my wheels trying to figure out what Job was saying because I was even, I was studying the Hebrew and I'm trying to figure out, Job, you know, where are we going? Look at the screen for a minute. We're going to look at this verse in the NIV, then the ESV, and then the NLT. It's going to just be so clear. Job says in the, in the NIV, why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? Now look at the ESV, the English Standard Version. Why are not times of judgment kept by the Almighty? And why do those who know him never see his days? The New Living Translation. Why doesn't the Almighty bring the wicked to judgment? And why must the godly wait for him in vain? Pretty clear, right? So, yeah. Hard lesson Randy learned this morning. But look at Job's words. They really reveal what's going on in his heart. And, and if you don't mind just looking at the NLT, put it back up there one more time, would you please? Why doesn't the Almighty bring the wicked to judgment? This is how Job is starting this chapter. He's, he's basically saying, I'm looking at the world around me, and I'm seeing that wicked men go from A to Z in their life, from beginning to end, and very rarely do we see wicked men being brought to account during this life. And so he says the second, why must the godly wait for him in vain? This is Job saying, I am a godly man. I'm a righteous man. I'm an upright man. When I do something wrong, I make it right. And yet look at what has happened to me in this last season of my life. I'm watching all these really wicked men prosper. And here I am, I've devoted my entire life to walking with the Lord and being upright and holy in His presence. And I'm experiencing sickness and I'm experiencing suffering. I've experienced loss from God and the list just goes on and on and on. And as I look at the world around me, I think that God is ignoring all of the wicked that men do. Have you ever been in that place where you just feel like, you know, what in the world is up with God? In fact, our message title, one more time tonight, where is God when the wicked are prospering? And we'll talk in depth about some specific things as we go on, maybe things that really frustrate us. But I think we can all relate to Job tonight, can't we? None of us are sitting here going, I've never been in that place. I think every one of us realize that there's times where we look and we think, man, Lord, I'm, you know, I'm doing everything in my power. I'm walking in the spirit. And I just think life has been tough for this last season. And I'm looking at these people that they hate you. They, they talk evil about you, and, you know, their, their Rolls Royces are many. They've got a fleet of them, you know. They've got, their garage is bigger than my entire house, right? And we just get so frustrated. I want to show you some things that really frustrated Job. He, he gives us, beginning in verse 2, a series of things that he saw that were really bugging him. Notice here, he says, some remove landmarks, they seize flocks violently, and they feed on them. We live in this day and age where um, we have GIS and GPS. I can get online, I can go to Spartanburg County's website, and I can look at the exact plot of the land that I live on. You know, I can see the four survey stakes from from a Google map, I'm guessing it is, you know, and I can, I can measure it and it's, you know, 0.536 acres or something like that according to the Spartanburg County website. And the thing is, is if my neighbor next door woke up one day and moved those stakes six feet my direction, I, I could easily go, ah, come on now, I know what you're doing. Job is going, you know what, what, what wicked people do? They move landmarks. Back in the day, landmarks were these big rocks that were placed at the corner. And, and you and the other guy would agree that your land ends here and my land begins here. Well, he decides one day he wants more land. And so at night, while you're snoring, he moves that thing your direction. His land just got bigger. And Job goes, you know, that's, that's what wicked people do. They steal from innocent people. Notice they seize flocks violently and they feed on them. And so they steal their neighbor's animals for food. And do you remember back in chapter 1, the Sabians came and they stole Job's 
flocks and were never held accountable. So you can see this is personal for Job. This isn't Job just going, you know what kind of things I think might be going on? They stole his land. They stole his flocks, right? Verse 3, notice they drive away the donkey of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox as a pledge. They push the needy off of the road. All the poor of the land are forced to hide. And so Job now says, he says, some of the wicked people, they, they oppress the poor and they oppress the needy. I want you to think about his three examples here. They drive away the donkey of the fatherless. You got this family, and, and all they have is a donkey. And that donkey, it's their John Deere tractor. It's their transportation to and from the store. I mean, it's everything. This, this donkey is, is keeping them alive, so to speak. Right? Maybe it earns them a couple of extra dollars on the weekends because they go and they plow somebody else's field. And Job says, you know what the wicked do? They think it's funny just to go to the house of the needy and drive away their donkey. Or, or they take the widow's ox as a pledge. You got this woman. Her husband has passed away. She has a couple of children. And all she has, again, is an ox. It's like a big John Deere tractor. It's just bigger than the donkey. And, and this thing is the only thing keeping them alive. It's, it's what's providing for them. And this widow owes some money to a creditor. Maybe her husband owed it before he died. And the creditor shows up and he says, I want my money. She says, I have no money. He says, okay, what do you have? She says, the only thing I have is this ox. It's my livelihood. If you take that, there's no way I can continue living. There's no way I can feed my children. And you know what the wicked do? They come along and they take the widow's ox as a pledge. Verse 4, they push the needy off the road. You know what that means? You've got needy people who are begging. They've found this little place on the road where people will pass by and be generous when they're, beg when they're, when they're begging. And Job says, you've got these people in our society, when they see needy people on the side of the road, you know, they push them away. They make them stop asking for alms. And look at the result. He says, all of the poor of the land are forced to hide. Job says, it's my observance that there are people out there that oppress the poor and the needy so badly that these people are forced to run and to hide. You know what's interesting is that Eliphaz accused Job of all of these things back in chapter 23. Eliphaz says, you do all these wicked things, and, and now Job comes along and he says, no, it's the wicked who do these things. And I'm a little frustrated because the wicked do these things and they never get called on the carpet for it. And now Job tells us of the effects that these wicked men have on the innocent people around them. Look at verse 5. He says, Indeed, like wild donkeys in the desert, they go out to their work searching for food. The wilderness yields food for them and for their children. They gather their fodder in the field and glean in the vineyards of the wicked. They spend the night naked without clothing and have no covering in the cold. They're wet with the showers of the mountains and they huddle around the rock for want of shelter. Now, in that, Job says a lot, and I'm going to kind of condense it down. Job talks about how the poor and the needy end up searching for food wherever they can go out and find it because they can't pay their debts, and their wicked creditors are, are coming along and taking their garments and pledge. That's why they're sleeping at night naked and without clothing. They're cold, without covering, all of these things that Job says here. And then he says... Um, well, before we get to verse 9, these things all Job was accused of in the previous chapter as well. And then look at verse 9. I mean, this is just cruel. He says, some snatch the fatherless from the breast and take a pledge from the poor. I want you to picture this widow we're talking about a few minutes ago. She's lost her ox, right? She's got this little baby. She's nursing the baby. And the creditor comes, wicked creditor comes, and says, listen, I need the money you owe me. And she says, I have no money to give you. And so he says, okay, I'm taking your child. And this child, from this day, even though this child is still nursing, it's not even old enough to work for me, this child is now going to become mine. And when it's old enough, it will become my slave. And this child will work until your debt is paid. And Job says, I have seen these things with my own eyes eyes. Look at verse 10. They cause the poor to go naked without clothing, and they take away the sheaves from the hungry. They press out oil within their walls, and they tread wine presses, and yet they suffer thirst. 
So again, if a person couldn't pay their debt, the creditor would take their clothing, we talked about this last week, and it would leave them utterly humiliated. I, I want you to just picture yourself. You're, you're poor, you're destitute, but you've got the clothes on your back, right? You're, you're, you're at least dressed to protect yourself from the elements. Some creditor comes along and says, pay me what you owe me, and you say, listen, I've got nothing. And he strips you of your very clothes. So here you are in a public place where, where other people are at, and you've been completely stripped naked. And although that in itself is humiliating, what it means in this society is everybody looks at you and says, man, can't you even pay your bills? Can't you even keep food on the table? Or are you such in such a low place that you can't even keep the clothes on your back? And notice the second phrase here. They take away the sheaves from the hungry. You've got these hungry, destitute people. They go out into the field and they glean in the field of a rich person. You know, you know what the laws were, right, in the Old Testament. This is even before that. But, but these things happened even before we read about them in the Old Testament law. Ancient cultures had welfare systems where when you went and you harvested your field, you only went through once. You didn't go a second time to pick up what was there. That was left for the poor and the widowless. I mean, the fatherless and the widow. This goes way beyond the writing of the Old Testament. And so now there you are, you're this poor person, you're out there and, and you're gleaning in the field and you find this sheaf of, of wheat and you're thinking, gosh, this is enough to feed my family for an entire evening. You know, and you're thinking, I'm gonna take this back and I'm gonna make some bread and as you come out of the field, there's that wicked creditor. And he goes, oh, so you do have something. And he snatches it right away from you. And Job says, I've seen these things with my own eyes. Notice this next one, verse 11. They press out oil within their walls and tread wine presses, yet suffer thirst. And, and I believe that this applies in two ways. I, I think that, number one, Job is describing how poor people oftentimes work for rich people. And they're working... And they're, they're doing hard work and they're getting no pay. And yet the rich person grows richer off of them. And as I look around, I don't know how many of us are, are business owners in here. I, you know, maybe one or two business owners in here. And you know, the, the thing about being a business owner is you have this really awesome opportunity to bless your employees. You have this really awesome opportunity to treat people fairly as part of your testimony. And Job is talking about business owners who abused their employees or their slaves in order that they could get rich. And we're being told, don't do that. But what else I see here? Get this picture of all these oppressed, poor people. They've been mistreated. And notice, they press out oil within their walls. They tread wine presses, yet they suffer thirst. You know, here's eight people, and they've banded together. They found four olives, and they put them in the olive press, and they're pressing the olive, and they've got enough olive oil, you know, for what? Nothing. And they're, they're pulling the gleanings, the, the last little bit out of the wine press when they've worked hoping that you know there's just going to be something for us and what they get is two drops of oil two drops of wine and there's eight of them and they're just looking at each other going what is going on we've worked hard we've fallen upon hard times and we're being mistreated and and job would say this is normal in the world that we live in and you know what it's normal in the world we live in too isn't it i, I shudder I, i'm really careful not to watch these documentaries and stuff because you know, when I need something, I don't know about you, I stop at the most convenient place. Do you guys do that? Most of the time I stop at the most convenient place. Once in a while it's Walmart. And you know, the Greer Walmart is one of the better Walmarts to shop in. If you've ever been to Walmarts, man, they're just crazy with crazy people. The Greer Walmart still has crazy people, but it's a little bit easier to shop in. But you know, we've shopped in Walmart for years and then all of a sudden someone sends me this email with an attachment. You realize that shopping at Walmart, what you're supporting, and here's this video of these kids in third, third world countries, you know, and I'm thinking, this is just like Job chapter 24, and I'm responsible for that, but you know what, I'm not. I don't own Walmart. If I choose to shop there, uh, you know, I'm not responsible 
for what the owner of Walmart does, especially if I don't know about it. So I've had, you know, people, I've, I've mentioned certain places from the pulpit, maybe where I get coffee or something like that, and then I'll get an email, you realize what you're supporting? No, I didn't know it until now. <laughs> You've just ruined my life. Now I gotta find somewhere else to get coffee. Listen, we're not responsible for things just because we spend money somewhere, but listen, there are times where you look at something and you realize this is a big enough deal that maybe I'm gonna start spending my money somewhere else. I'm, I'm not starting something tonight. I'm not about to name companies that we're gonna boycott here at Calvary Chapel. I'm just saying there is a time that you say, God has gotten my attention. I think I'm gonna look into this. There's other times where you just go, if I spent all my time trying to find a, sh a place to shop where this company doesn't support something that the Bible says is wrong, you know what? We would not be able to buy gas or food or any other thing. So we just have to be careful with becoming activists on everything. But this is what Job is saying. He's saying, we live in a world where the rich oppress the poor, and we have this Father in heaven who isn't doing anything about it. Look now, verse 12, Job is gonna summarize all of his frustrations, and we're gonna get to see what's in his heart now. Look, he says, the dying groan in the city, and the souls of the wounded cry out, Yet God does not charge them with wrong. Is that a great summary of everything we've talked about tonight? Job just lays it out there. I want to pull us for a minute, just a little bit of body life here. Read verse 12 and tell me exactly what's going on in Job's heart. Raise your hand and speak loud, please. Read verse 12. Tell me what's going on in Job's heart. What do you see? Ryan? Say it again. S selfishness in Job's heart? Could be. Yeah. What else do we see, guys? Despair, yeah, Job's, Job sees something he can do nothing about. We got despair. What else? He's blaming God, God. yep. A anybody ever been in that place where you get frustrated and you say, you know, God, hello, what are you doing? What are you not doing, Harry? He wants justice. Okay, so I'm going to build off of what Harry just said. I believe that Job's heart is in the right place. I believe that Job is expressing his heart in the wrong way. Because what he's doing is what, what Tim just said, is that he's kind of blaming God. He's, he's holding God accountable for something that he does not really understand. And so as, as he's, as he, oh, I just want to look at the verse, jump into the verse. The dying groan in the city. You know, the, the, they were dying because they were being oppressed the souls of the wounded cry out. They, they were wounded by their situation. They were wounded by the rich oppressor, oppressors. And now they're crying out to the Lord. And then Job says this, God doesn't charge the wicked with wrong. It seems that God is just ignoring. And so Job was definitely frustrated with God. And we've talked tonight about the fact that we oftentimes share Job's frustrations. I'll, I'm going to just share my heart with you. Can I do that? Thank you, Ann. I tell you what I get frustrated with, and it's not frustration with God, it's, it's frustration with, with the system, but you know, I think about people, you know, maybe sometimes people in our own church who are struggling to make ends meet, they're working hard, but the system is just rigged, you know? The system is just against them, and, and they're working really hard to make ends meet, but you know, they're just, they're not making ends meet. And then you think about a Hollywood movie producer who's getting rich selling smut, right? That frustrates me. That frustrates me really bad. You know what else frustrates me really bad? Is, you know, when, when we really, really have needs here at the church that, that we want to be able to, you know, to meet. You know, we, we want to hire more staff or we want to be able to do more benevolence. And I'm thinking, you know, we're just... We're able to do a lot. We, we've, we've, we're paying people every week, every month. We're making payroll. But I'm just thinking we could do so much more if we were able to, you know, to have a few more people on staff. And then I think about a congressman, and not all of them are crooked. But you got these guys who are—they're using their position to do illegal things, and they're getting kickbacks. They're getting rich, and none of them are on Obamacare either. And that's a whole different Bible study, right? <laughs> It's a whole different Bible study, but you got these guys, and, and they're just pressing Obamacare upon every poor person in our nation. It's terrible health care. It costs an arm and a leg, and I don't know of one of them that are on it. 
they got these fantastic health plans because they've got all of these things frustrate me and every once in a while I wake up in the middle of the night and and I'm praying about things and I realize this is a Job 24 prayer and I need to repent real quick because my heart's going sideways Lord what you know and, and you just start getting frustrated Job's mistake here and the mistake that that I make and probably that you make is thinking that God is ignoring all this God is not ignoring all this. He wasn't in Job's day. He is not today. And I'm going to look at three sections of Scripture with you, and we're going to get a little bit of a perspective change tonight. We're going to get an attitude adjustment if necessary. We're going to look at Revelation 20 twice, but in between, we're going to look at Isaiah 2. So jump to Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. We're, we're going to look at the future of the world. In Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, John says this. He says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Many believe that this angel is Jesus. Other scholars say it's not. It appears to be Jesus. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and he shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now hold your place, turn to Isaiah 2, and then we'll come back to Revelation 20. I'm reading these in order, and then I'll, I'll summarize them for you. Isaiah 2, 4, He, this is Jesus, shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Back to Revelation 20. I promise I'll summarize all this in a minute. Re Revelation 20, verse 11. And John says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, the, the, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me summarize all this. The first part of Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, we see Jesus, he dethroned Satan, who is the God of this world. The reason that the stuff is going on that Job is frustrated about and that I'm frustrated about and you're frustrated about, we've been talking about it on Sunday mornings. First John chapter 5, the whole world lies under the sway of the evil one, right? Satan, the god of this world, is influencing men to live selfish lives and oppress others and sinful and all this stuff. And we get to Revelation 20, 1 through 3. Jesus just comes along and he dethrones him and he chains him in a pit. And then Isaiah 2, 4 comes after Revelation 21 through 3 chronologically, what Isaiah sees is the beginning of the great millennial reign of Christ, when Jesus Christ rules and reigns upon the earth. And look at a couple of things. He's going to judge, and he's going to rebuke. The scripture says in other places that he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Sin is going to be dealt with quickly during the thousand-year reign, swiftly and quickly. And then back to Revelation 20, 11 through 15, you see that the unregenerate dead of every generation are resurrected and every sinful action recorded in God's books is called to account. We look at people doing wicked, sinful things and we think, God, what are you doing? Let me tell you what he's doing. He's got a scribe in heaven and that scribe is writing down every single thing that goes on. Every wicked person who does a wicked thing, they're not getting away with it. Every wicked person who does a wicked thing, it's being recorded in a book. 
And that book one day is going to be used to judge every unregenerate person, every person who is not saved. So when we're sitting back going, God, when are you going to do something? He goes, I'm going to do something. And when I do it, it is going to be thorough and it is going to be complete. And there will be no questions. There will be no backtalk. There will be no anything. It will be swift and it will be eternal. And you know, right now, none of us cheered. I noticed that. Not a single one of us said, yeah, God, right? Because we're sobered, realizing that every sinful act, every wicked act that is not punished here on this earth or disciplined here on this earth is going to cause people to spend eternity in hell, in the lake of fire, paying for their sins. And as I was studying today and I was praying over this, my prayer was, Lord, give me more passion for the lost. Give me more opportunity to get out and share the gospel with people. Lord, every one of these wicked acts that you're not dealing with now, you are going to deal with in eternity. And I want to lead people to repentance before they have to go answer for those acts. Is that sobering tonight? That is extremely sobering for me. Back to Job chapter 24. We get now to verse 13. After all of this, Job kind of jumps right back in. And he says something that's really, really powerful. This, this could lead us down a bunch of rabbit trails. I promise we won't do that. But you could do some cross-referencing maybe at some time. And, and I think you just have a fantastic time learning God's word. I want you to notice what he says in verse 13. There are those who rebel against the light. They do not know its way, nor abide in its paths. Now, I want you to look at two words. It's the phrase, the light. Now, I mentioned earlier, there, there's two schools of thought, two major ideas that come forth from scholars regarding the book of Job. Many believe that Job lived before any of God's word was ever recorded in written form. And there are others who see what they believe to be quotes from the law, especially the book of Deuteronomy in the book of Job. I, I struggle to see those things. I, I don't see those things. I don't believe that any of God's word was written by the time Job lived. Uh, I could be wrong, but I've put some time into studying this. I, I, I just don't believe that. Beginning in verse 13, Job speaks about something. And, and notice this phrase, the light. I don't think that Job and his contemporaries had a Bible. I don't believe that Job could say, well, you know, Bildad, if you were to turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 13, you would see that. I, I don't believe, I, th I think we would see more quoting of Scripture if that was the case. But Job says something. He says, we all have the light. And in verse 13, he says, there are those who rebel against the light. And Job is reminding us that God has programmed every human being with two things. Number one is knowledge about his existence. And the second is a conscience. And if you had time tonight and, and you could turn to Romans chapter 1, you would see that Paul talks about these two things, that God has programmed us with a knowledge of his existence and a conscience. And what I did is I, I did a study of Romans chapter 1 this morning, and then I, I summarized it so that you don't have to turn there. You can do it later. But Paul says three things that I want to focus on in, in Romans chapter 1 regarding the light. He says that creation itself testifies to you and I and to every person who has ever, li ever lived that there is a creator and that you and I are accountable to him. And then Paul also says that every person who has ever lived has a conscience. And God uses this conscience to speak to us when we're doing right and when we're doing wrong. And then Paul says, and this is really powerful when you study this in Romans chapter 1, he says, when people choose to continually reject God, reject the light he's given us, they pursue sinful pleasures, God will eventually give them over to their vile passions, their hearts become hardened and they no longer hear God's voice anymore. They no longer feel their conscience telling them this is wrong. Their conscience gets seared, their heart gets hard. And you wonder, how can a person just do that over and over and over? They got to a place where God gave them over to their vile passions. And God just says, listen, if you're going to reject me, that, that's fine. Go do your thing. Notice what Job says, verse 13. There are those who rebel against the light. They don't know 
its ways, meaning the way that God leads us, nor do they abide in its paths, the, the paths that God leads us in. And Job now describes the way that those who ignore the light act. Notice, the murderer arises with the light, and, and this is kind of a, an unfortunate play on words in English. What it really should say is, the murderer arises at dawn, he kills the poor and needy, and in the night, he is like a thief. And, and so Job says, this is what you get when a person has rejected the light of God's revelation, is that they arise, they kill the poor and the needy, and, and then they steal from other people at night. Verse 15, he says, the eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, no eye will see me and he disguises his face. Job, Job is describing how an adulterer knows that he's doing wrong, and so he does it under the cover of darkness so that he's not caught by men, but he forgets that God sees everything. Look at verse 16. In the dark, they break into houses which they marked for themselves in the daytime. He's, Job's just describing. You know what happens when people stop walking in the light? They stop listening to God? They study you. I just, I get an email uh, Probably a group of us here in the church and leadership get it. It's from a guy who does training for church security. And the email this week was about a Catholic church up in North Carolina, I believe it was. And the person who takes the offering to the bank on Monday morning was taking the same route and going at the same time. And it was the same person every week. And all the robbers had to do is sit across the street with binoculars for a few weeks, and they, they realized every single Monday morning at 10 o'clock, this person gets in this car and takes this route, and they get to the bank and they put the deposit in this box. So they just waited at the bank. And when the woman got out to make the church deposit, they, uh, you know, they attacked her and they, they took the money. And so the email this week was to the churches saying, change things up a little bit because people are studying you, right? And Job says it right there. He says, in the dark, they break into houses which they marked for themselves in the daytime. During the day, they studied, they watched, they waited for the family to go on vacation. Boom, they go in and they steal. Job says, this is because men reject the light of God. And, and I've just been thinking about 1 John 1 5 all day as I'm studying this, where John told us God is light and in him is what? No darkness at all. So oftentimes Christians will say, well, you know, it's just a little pot on the weekends, or it's just, you know, it's just a little adultery. It's not a lot of adultery. It's just a little. Listen, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 17 For the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. If someone recognizes them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. Job says these people who have ignored the light, they've rejected the light, as soon as they get in the light, it's a terror to them because the light shines into their darkness and reveals their deeds. And it's interesting because many of the deeds that we've been reading about, we've got murder and we've got thievery and we've got adultery and many of these were capital offenses even before the law of Moses came around. In these ancient cultures, if someone was committing adultery, the husband would just kill the guy and it, it was not something he's gonna go to prison for. If somebody murdered one of your family members, you were expected to go and to instill, you know, capital punishment upon them. The, the whole idea of eye for eye and tooth for tooth and kinsman redeemer and all those things from the Old Testament, much of that existed long before God brought it into the Bible. And so Job is just basically saying, notice, they should be swift on the face of the waters. The Hebrew says they're unstable like the foam on the waters. Their portion should be cursed in the earth so that no one would turn into the way of their vineyards. This is really interesting. This took a lot of study, but basically what Job is saying, he says, we're dealing here with a group of people who have no desire to put in an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. They would rather you put in an honest day's work, get your honest day's pay, and they're going to come take it from you when you're not looking. And Job says, this is the kind of people that the world is filled with and that God is doing nothing about. And if it didn't sound so bad on the, re on the recording, I would pound the pulpit right now because I think that's what Job would do. He'd just go, dang it. Right? He's frustrated. Job is just so upset. And then all of a sudden in verse 19, Job changes gears. 
and, and up to this point, he's just made all these general observances about people who live this way. But now he comes back to his senses a bit. And I, I'm going to read it. I want to see if anybody picks up on it. Where, where is Job going? He says, as drought and heat consume the snow waters, so the grave consumes those who have sinned. The womb should forget him. The, their worm should, the worm should feed sweetly on him. He should be remembered no more, and wickedness should be broken like a tree. Anybody see where Job's going? Anybody picking up on this new direction Job has? You want to shout it out? Anybody? Betty Ann? I think it's funny seeing that they are get. Yeah. Yeah, he, Betty Ann hit the, the nail on the head. She said, Job is seeing that they are going to get what they deserve. And Job just basically says this, death is the great equalizer. You know, when death comes along, this guy is going to get his. And, and notice, he says, the grave consumes those who have sinned. And so the wages of sin is death. And Job says, death is going to get these guys, even if God doesn't get them beforehand. The womb should forget him. He's literally saying, the, the, the mother who bore this guy will be glad to see him go because he's been nothing but trouble for her. The worm should feed sweetly on him. This guy has been feeding on other people like a parasite all his life, like a thief. And now the worms are going to just feed sweetly on him. He should be remembered no more and wickedness should be broken like a tree. You know, at, at his death, the wickedness will finally end. And, and now verse 21, he says, he preys on the barren who do not bear and, and, and does no good for the widow. He, he's basically just saying, you know, that, that men like this, they're wicked to the core. You know, women who don't bear, that was a very, very bad place to be in society. If a woman couldn't have children, she was disgraced. And then you've got a widow, a woman who can't even take care of herself. And Job says, these guys do wicked things to these kind of women. Verse 22, but God draws the mighty away with his power. He rises up, but no man is sure of life. He gives them security, and they rely on it. Yet his eyes are on their ways. They're exalted for a little while. And, and Job is just saying that, that after the wicked live this way for an extended period of time, they often begin to think that God is okay with it. They begin to think that maybe God even approves of it. And then all of a sudden, notice, then they are gone. They are brought low. They are taken out of the way like all others. They dry out like the heads of grain. And so the same thing, Job says, all of a sudden, without warning, comes the end. But it's interesting, I started looking at these phrases in verse 24, brought low, taken out of the way like all others, dried out like the heads of grain. I can't help but see a picture of a harvest. I think Job is using the picture of a harvest as a word picture. And it's interesting because throughout scripture, harvesting, is used as an analogy for God coming in and dealing with the wicked of the earth. Last time you'll turn away from Job tonight, just go to Revelation 14. In, in Revelation 14, 17 through 19, we, we have a picture of a harvest taking place. And I want you to see what's being harvested. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. People being harvested and taken to judgment, taken to the wrath of God. And so Job had this Old Testament picture of what we read about in the book of Revelation, this harvest, people bring, being brought to the wrath of God. And so we'll end with verse 25 here. Chapter 24 comes to an end. Last thing Job says is, now if it is not so, who will prove me a liar and make my speech worth nothing? This is Job just basically saying to his audience, I've spoken the truth about the future of the wicked, and who will challenge me on these things? I mean, how can you, everything Job said is true, right? Everything he says can be proven both biblically and just by looking at the world. And he says, 
Who can prove me wrong on these things? Who can make my speech worth nothing? Well, leave it to Bildad, right? And, and there's only six verses. So you're thinking, we've still got a whole chapter. We've just got six verses. Bildad, you know, who, Job says, can make my speech worth nothing? Well, Bildad comes along and says, well, I guess I have to do that. And what we're going to see with Bildad in just these six short verses is we're going to get a glimpse into the heart of a fool. The, a glimpse into the heart of a very, very foolish man. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, this is important, he says, dominion and fear belong to him. He makes peace in his high places. Is there any number to his armies? Upon whom does his light not rise? If you took the time to look at everything that Bildad said, what you would find is that Bildad repeated things that both Job and himself and Eliphaz and Zophar said in previous chapters. In other words, he stumped. He has no idea what to say, so he just starts babbling. And, and here's the thing. When you're in a position where you don't have anything to say, you know what a great rule of thumb is? Keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. But Proverbs talks about how foolish people just blab on and on and on. Blah, 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 blah right? You ever get cornered by somebody and, and after they've talked for 10 or 15 minutes, you just kind of feel like, is this ever going to stop? You know, they're just going on and on and on and you don't even know what they're talking about. And, and Bildad, notice it says, he answered and he said, dominion and fear belong to him. He makes peace in his high places. Is that true? It is absolutely true. God is the king. He has dominion over everything. Look at verse 3. Is there any number to his armies? How many times throughout Scripture do we have this picture of the armies of heaven, the host of heaven, the 185,000 angels that couldn't be seen, and yet they were there? Jesus is on the cross. He says, I could call 12 legions of angels to deliver me. Bildad is right. God has endless resources at his disposal. Upon whom does his light not rise? He, he basically speaks truth. What sin is there hidden anywhere that God's light does not shine upon? Is there anything? Right? And, and we're all just kind of thinking, well, this isn't bad. Zophar is just kind of speaking biblical truth back to Job. It's probably the greatest thing we've seen coming forth from any of Job's friends, right? But here's what makes Bildad a fool is that Bildad is using God's word as a weapon against another believer instead of using it as, as a source of instruction and comfort. See, when he says these things, we'll look at them one more time. He says, dominion and fear belong to him. He makes peace in his high places. He's saying, Job, God knows everything you've done and he's going to judge you. When he says here, is there any number to his armies? Job, God has legions of angels at his disposal. He's going to send them to bring his wrath upon you. Upon whose light does, upon whom does his light not rise? Job, God sees everything you've done and this that you're suffering is his wrath upon you. And then look what he says. How can a man be righteous before God or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? Job, you keep talking about how you're upright before the Lord, but no man can be upright if he's been born of a woman. <coughs> This guy believed in the doctrine of original sin. Do you see that? All the way back at the time after the flood, everybody understood the doctrine of original sin. He says, Job, <coughs> we're born sinners. We're, we're born into this world. Notice what he says here. Now it gets really bad. If even the moon does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is a maggot and a son of man who is a worm? You know, Job, the stars shine bright, the moon shines bright, but you're not shining all that bright. And, and you think that you're okay with God, but you're not. You know what you are, Job? You're a maggot. You're a worm. Those are harsh words, aren't they? And what he's doing is he's using the word of God to beat up his brother instead of using the word of God to comfort and to restore a broken man. And you know, Christians do that a lot. 
It's something we have to be very careful not to do. The Word of God is not a weapon against your brother. The Word of God is something that God uses in order to restore broken people. And we'll end because um, Eliphaz's words here, I'm sorry, Bildad, I keep saying Eliphaz, Bildad, he asked a question, and we're just going to end with this. How can a man be righteous before God, and how can he be pure who is born of a woman? I think that deserves an answer. So just look at the screen. Romans 5, 18 and 19. You may have an opportunity to share this. Someone may say to you, well, you know what? You know, how can anybody become righteous? There's two parts to what Paul says here. It says, therefore, as, th as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. He's talking about Adam's sin being passed to everybody and how all of us are born into this condemnation of sin. Part two, he says, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. The gospel message is so powerful. Jesus' substitutionary death opened the door for everybody who will receive the free gift of eternal life. And then Paul sums it up in 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. I just couldn't not do that tonight. Bildad asked the question, how can a person born of a woman be made righteous? We had to answer it. And it's right there in Romans 5, 18 and 19. And so Job will answer him next week. But tonight, just two things we have to do before we leave. Review chapter 24. If you're frustrated with God not judging, remember that those people are going to be judged in eternity. So it's our job to bring them the gospel. And second of all, remember this from Bill Dad's mistake. Never use the Word of God as a weapon against a fellow believer. The Word of God is to be used as something that restores and leads people back to Christ, but never to beat them up. If you have a tendency to beat people up with God's Word, just, just be careful. That is not what the Lord wants. Father, thank you for the book of Job. This has been just chapter after chapter, Lord, of, of really, really deep theological truth and practical truth. Tonight, Lord, we want to thank you that even in the midst of frustration, we can learn a lot. Frustrated Christians probably need to be sharing the gospel more. When we're frustrated that you're not doing something about the evil that goes on in this world, it's probably an indication that our hearts have become hard towards the people who are doing evil. Lord, one day they are going to stand before you and the books are going to be opened and they are going to be cast forever into the lake of fire. But we have an opportunity, Lord, to share with them what Paul wrote to these Romans. That yes, Adam's offense brought judgment to all of us, brought condemnation, but Jesus' one act, his death upon the cross, opened a door that any of us who would repent of our sin receive that free gift of salvation. Lord, we would be born again. We would bypass that judgment. We would spend our eternity in your presence as your children. And so, Lord, tonight, give us a heart for the lost. Help us to stop being frustrated. Help us, Lord, never to beat each other up with the Word of God. Help us, Lord, to gain a desire for evangelism and delivering the lost to you where you can save them, Lord. So hear our prayer. Strengthen us. And as we worship you tonight, Lord, we pray that you just stir our hearts. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.